Hello, good morning. Hello, good morning. Hello. Welcome again. I think that we are, we have to wait five minutes for the other participants. After that, we can start the presentation. I think that we are waited enough. We can start. And just a second. Pablo is coming. Okay. 
Okay, I think that we have waited enough. Uh, so, again, uh, hi everyone, welcome. Uh, first of all, I would like to present myself. My name is Idris Hocaoğlu. I am in charge of as business development team leader at Technopark Istanbul, which is one of the technology centers in the STARS project. Unfortunately, my colleague, Mrs. Betil Kartal, cannot be able to attend today's session due to health reasons. Therefore, I am presenting in her stead today. Uh, I would like to thank you all for attending today's STARS tutorial session. As you know that STARS project is aims to support and empower railway SMEs of all sizes and sectors from innovative tech startups to traditional crafts in the post-COVID competitive economy. To provide SMEs with needed technological assistance, we started to do these tutorial webinars. Today, topics is advanced material usage in railway industry. We will learn more about advanced materials as well as emerging smart materials and relevant micro and nano fabrication approach from our technology transfer manager, assistant professor Nihan Aydemir. We will dive into the current trends and possible future strategies to decrease carbon footprint and improve sustainability. Without further ado, I would like to give to Mike, to my manager. Right. Thank you very much, Idris, for this nice introduction. You're welcome. First of all, uh, I would like to welcome all uh, participants and members of STARS project. Uh, my name is uh, Nihan Aydemir, and uh, I will today talk about uh, Edmunds materials used in railway industry. I think it's a good idea to stop video because it may sometimes interfere with the uh, presentation. Right. Whenever, first sort of let me talk about myself. Uh, I did graduate from chemistry uh, from Istanbul Technical University. And then I completed my first master's on uh, polymer science and technology where I sort of studied on composites. And after that, I went to New Zealand to conduct my uh, PhD on uh, using nanomaterials for biosensing applications, right? And upon my upon completion of my PhD, I did another master's on commercialization and entrepreneurship. Why did I do a second master's? Because I, uh, during my PhD studies, I developed certain techniques that can be used uh, for commercial biosensors. And I sort of de uh, developed a certain interest on commercialization of high-tech uh, applications. And after that, I came back to Turkey and attended as an assistant professor to Gebze Technical University. I am still conducting my academic duties. And also since, I guess, three months, I have been working as a manager of technology transfer office at Technopark Istanbul. Yeah, so whenever, so this, this very picture uh, tells a lot of things, right? 
So as humankind, we went to the moon in 1969, right? And until 1972, we were carrying our luggages by hand. We had luggages for hundreds of years, maybe thousands. We used them. First of all, we perhaps started as boxes and we carried them all around, right? For hundreds of years. No one thought putting it real, right? It's it's pretty interesting. So the first real luggage was invented in 1972 after we went to moon. So this is pretty interesting. Huh? So we have all that ad, uh, advanced technology. We can conquer space, but we carry 20 to 30 kgs by hand. So this is a little bit sort of uh, dramatic, if you ask me. Nobody knew that we actually needed wheels. Nobody thought about it. It's pretty interesting, right? And the luggage, as we know, the luggage that we use today was first introduced in 1991. This story or this very example tells a lot about innovations. We may be doing things as we have been doing because we are in our comfort zone, because things are working. But we may always improve them. So that is the key, key study or key factor that we should perhaps take out of this example. <clears throat> In terms of the railways, we do have very humble beginnings, uh, but the developing certain tracks for transportation or for um, going around, let's say, for traveling, uh, is actually back to uh, 3,838 BC. So the first, the earliest first post track was found in England. And interestingly, UK is, uh, has always dominated the railway industry, right? So this is a little bit interesting coincidence to mind. And we do here see another sort of trackway, which resembles to our railways, right? So this was made in Greece. Uh, 600 BC, at 600 BC, right? So these are limestones and people were using these uh, trackways to carry boats on wheels. So that's why uh, it actually has a, has a trackway. And people use this for hundreds of years, uh, for quite often really. And after that, yeah, after that, people started moving around, right? So industrialization, civilization, all moved forward pretty quickly. And people started building sort of ways of transformation, mass transformation. That was the key actually. And how did it happen? First, they sort of uh, had all these trolleys that they carry on uh, sort of cast iron strips, which were laid on timber. Rails. So this was an era between uh, 17th 
10 to 80s, perhaps. And cast iron was mainly used. Uh, it is a, why cast iron? Because it, it's the easiest one to make, first of all. And it actually is a class of iron, carbon alloy, which we use today as well. So it's still used today, but not in railways, of course. And the main characteristic of cast iron that it contains uh, carbon content more than 2%, okay? And it is usually less than 4%. Why it is useful? Because it melts at low temperatures. So you do not have too much energy or big factories to make cast iron, right? Uh, Obviously, the earliest cast iron artifacts actually date back to 15th century BC. So that's it's a quite sort of material that has been around for a long time. And usually it is made from pig iron. Uh, obviously, pig iron is a product of uh, melting iron ore in a blast furnace. And cast iron can be made directly from the molten pig iron, uh, often along with substantial quantities of either uh, iron, limestone, and carbon. And it actually takes either a few steps to remove undesirable contaminants. It is a durable uh, material against corrosion. However, it is extremely hard uh, and it, hence it can be brittle under resistance. And it has a weak performance under sort of applied pressure. Also, as a weak tensile strength, that means if you try to bend or stretch it, it will fracture. But it has been used in uh, railways sort of for around the, like a hundred year. And if we sort of think about what was the load capacity back then, it was not much. So it did the job. But after uh, 80s, a, obviously a, something else has to be sort of used because even you can see in this sort of uh, picture that it really is not in a good condition. Right. To wrought iron, obviously it replaced the cast iron partially between um, 1820 and 1860. The thing about wrought iron is <clears throat> it contains less carbon because it, it is sort of made by oxidizing impurities in furnace lined with ferric oxide. The ferric oxide oxidizes carbon to carbon monoxide. So that's what the purpose of ferric oxide in here. And hence, the carbon content uh, lowers down to 0.08%. So that's pretty low compared to uh, cast iron. And it makes it, so decreasing carbon content obviously makes it soft, right? So, and it is easy to shake. We still use this beautiful material all around the world for decorative purposes. In fact, even today, we do see uh, rail stations have, so it was not only used in railways for the tracks, it was also used for the decoration of railways, the construction of the railway stations. So 
we see all these beautiful decorations all around the world. It is stronger than cast iron, but it is so soft to be durable. It's not as durable as the uh, cost. And also it's expensive to make. <laughs> and it has been completely replaced by the steel. And hence the remaining examples are only the <clears throat> decorative works in stations nowadays. And also uh, there are still sort of uh, places that uh, do wrought iron artifacts or decorative items that one can use uh, for uh, either uh, housing or architecture purposes. Right, still, still, exactly. People had steel, by the way, right? During the wrought iron times, but it was expensive to make and it wasn't possible to make at mass quantities to actually use it in railways. However, the invention of Bessemer process and the production of inexpensive steel was uh, possible in late uh, 1850s. Right? Again, the first uh, steel rail was fabricated in England. And how Bessemer process worked from a point of view, Uh, <clears throat> the main sort of advantage of the Bessemer process, it uses this open mouth uh, sort of uh, furnace. This is a specified furnace that helps uh, sort of both uh, removing melted iron and so far, so on. Before the development of this open mouth furnace, the process used to molten pig iron to melt iron. The real difference with this process was air was actually forced through the molten iron to remove the impurities. So that was sort of like the main uh, difference. Iron uh, would be added to molten pig and melted down to a bubbling point. By blowing oxygen, impurities would oxidize and they would be separated as gas molecules or slag or in a slag sort of solid or they would solidify in a slag. What were these impurities? They were silicon, manganese, carbon, or anything, uh, or any sort of like uh, other sort of impurities that would iron contain. Right, and after that, after the Bessemer process, the kingdom of steel, uh, has started in railways. This train was made completely by steel. Right? So it's made of steel. Everything is steel. Everything is metal. Uh, also, we had uh, railway tracks. We had railway bridges. We had stations. Everything almost made of steel. Right, And even today, when we look at that, we still have 90% of metal, either steel or aluminum, on a train, right? And we also have steel for the railway tracks as well. And apart from that, we do have uh, three point 
0.5% of composite materials, again, around 3.2% of fabric. Glass, 1.8, obviously we need glass windows. And also we have a very minor other materials that is used. This comes with a big problem. Why? Because first, steel and aluminum, they're both, aluminum is obviously way cheaper than steel, but metal, especially steel, is heavy, right? And because it's, it's heavy, it actually sort of affects the overall load that the train can carry. Also, it negatively affects the consumption, okay? Or uh, the oil consumption or the power consumption could be an electrical train. And also, obviously, steel will corrode, right? So it's susceptible to corrosion. That comes with a high maintenance sort of cause. That is why uh, people sort of started introducing aluminum into the uh, sort of making all these trains. And actually, that started around 1960s, if I'm not mistaken. And it was first used in the Cog Railways as a very niche market. And after that, around 1980s, uh, aluminum emerged uh, as a metal of choice for suburban transportation and high-speed trains. Why? Because they benefited from the lower running costs and improved acceleration coming from the lighter weight of the aluminum. I guess it was the mid 90s, the TGV, the black strain was introduced uh, and it combined the concept of high speed with optimal capacity. And by the help of uh, reducing the weight of the train body itself, uh, it actually could uh, carry 40% more passengers. And this was possible because of the aluminum structure. Obviously, today uh, we see aluminum more in metros and tram, uh, trams. There are a lot of sort of, um, again, applications. However, aluminum, again, uh, is, is a high sort of um, high maintenance material. Also, production of aluminum, again, requires a lot of energy as well as uh, sort of uh, production process of not only aluminum. First of all, you have to mine it, right? You mine it and then you process it to turn into uh, aluminum, sort of raw aluminum, and then you process it to make all these different shapes and that all requires high energy processing. In terms of the steel, obviously we do have three main types of steel. Uh, carbon steel is, is actually uh, used a lot in railway industry, as you all know, and uh, a medium carbon steel is usually used with a grade of 1,084 or higher. Uh, it takes advantage of carbon and manganese elements 
<clears throat> to increase the strength. We are expecting a point, somewhere between 0.4 to 0.8 percent of carbon content. And uh, we are expecting manganese to be less than 1.3 percent. Right? And then we do have these fancy alloy steels. And, and in these cases, uh, obviously, uh, iron is mixed with uh, alloy elements such as vanadium, titanium, uh, and less fancy chromium and tin uh, to increase the strength and toughness. They are better than carbon still. However, they are more expensive. So there's always a trade between the initial cost and the maintenance cost. So we, we always have to think about both ways. And heat treated still, so this could be any type of air, right? It could be carbon or it could be alloy. In this case, we sort of uh, apply another heating and controlled cooling to improve the properties of uh, the steel that we have. That adds another process, a step of process. However, it drastically improves the mechanical properties and service life. It also decreases the maintenance cost. So it is usually preferred if, if your steel is heat treated uh, after the initial fabrication. When we look at the content of steel, obviously uh, we do have carbon, especially in railway. And then that carbon is somewhere between 0.6 to 0.8%. And what it does, it actually improves the uh, strength and wave resistance of the rail itself. And we do have silicon. And what it does, it sort of uh, helps to remove the bubbles. And manganese also resembles to carbon. Uh, and it also removes the iron oxide and sulfide inclusions within the steel. Sulfide inclusions can be really painful, uh, especially in uh, steel all these small inclusions that we have. So I actually did a study on them. So that's my personal touch. Uh, these inclusions uh, are around one micron wide. So they could be somewhere like one micron or two, three micron, nothing more, right? And then uh, still starts uh, a level of pitting corrosion through that micro inclusions. And it goes all the way down. So it's one, let's think about that. It's actually one micron wide hole, but it can go down easily to 0.5 millimeter, which I personally measure. So it's crazy. It creates all sort of uh, cracks within the material and hence they need to be re removed from the steel itself. However, it, it is said it is stainless steel, but stainless steel again corrodes. We should not forget that. Copper is used to improve the fatigue resistance and also corrosion resistance. We do not want um, phosphor, phosphorus or uh, sort of sulfides in our steel anyway. Yes, in terms of so the 90% metal, right? How we can change this? how we can improve it. 
Why, first of all, why do we want to improve it? Why do we want to change it? So we have to answer that. I guess the main answer would be the carbon emissions uh, coming from different stages of our current railway uh, structure. First is the high carbon emission process involved in metal processing to make what we uh, use in our trains. And second one uh, would be the weight because with the metals, uh, either steel or aluminum, you still have a lot of weight. However, aluminum is way lighter than the steel, but it's not that strong. So you cannot actually use it for all type of trains. So we must take that into consideration. So we are looking for a material that would replace uh, all these uh, sort of disadvantages. And also metals are susceptible to corrosion, oxidation, and we do not want that to happen. Because why, if, if something corrodes, you either have to replace it or uh, re sort of uh, remake it. So this, that's an expensive process, right? So that comes with a maintenance cost. We do not want that. For these reasons, people started looking emerging materials. And what are these materials? So these are advanced alloys. So we talked about advanced alloys, those fancy titanium, vanadium containing alloys. And then we do have technical ceramics and we do have polymer composites or fiber reinforced composites. So these are actually similar. Fiber reinforced composites are actually a type of polymer composites. If we talk about, and they actually hold a great promise uh, in terms of all type of transportation uh, industry, right? So you can make trains, you can make cars, you can make um, sort of planes. All. In fact, in fact, the jets are made from fiber reinforced polymers, right? Aviation industry already started using it. Cars, we see, we already see them in in race cars or even certain everyday car uh, brands with a premium sort of level. What do they do? First of all, what are fiber uh, reinforced polymers? So they, we do have a fiber content, right? So this could be made from different materials, which we will have a look. And then you do have a polymer resin. What it does, it decreases the weight and hence energy consumption. They are light in weight, high in strength. They do have proper high stiff values and travel in nature, resistant to coll corrosion and falling. So it's not about only corrosion. You also have to deal with biofalling as well. They are excellent candidates for making vehicle bodies and frameworks that actually has to sustain loads or weight. What would be the main advantage as they decrease the weight without compromising any strength or durability? In fact, they provide better durability. First of all, they would help to decrease the energy consumption because the overall vehicle will be lighter. Second, they, they would reduce the strain on the rail infra 
the infrastructures itself so that they will be lighter. Huh? Reducing maintenance requirements. You do not have to paint them every year. You do not have to apply anti-corrosive coatings and so on. And they would, by doing that, you could simply free certain amount of weight for additional passengers that would give you sort of extra, <clears throat> sorry, that would give you sort of extra income. And also it would affect the carbon print of transportation itself. Types of, so we do, as we said before, we do have a fiber content and we do have a polymer or matrix content. In terms of fibers, we do have uh, highly gloss fibers. We do use gloss fibers or we, we can use sort of carbon fibers, aramid fibers and other type of fibers. So these are actually used in railway vehicles. They, people, and, uh, why the glass fiber is the highest? Because it's the cheapest. Glass fiber is cheap. It's easy to make as well, compared to carbon and aramid. Aramid is the most expensive, actually. And what would be the matrix or polymer? Uh, we, you can use polyester uh, or epoxy or you can use uh, sort of phenolic resins, acrylic resins, or vinyl esters. So these are all possible combinations. So you can simply use carbon fiber with epoxy resin, beautiful. And it's that uh, duo is used in aviation actually. And, or you can use glass fibers with polyesters, or you can try epoxy as well, no problem. And what would be the choice? Like, how do you decide whether to choose which material in terms of uh, are, how are we going to replace it? Are we going to replace it, right? This could be, there's actually a criteria developed for it. So first of all, this is not only for fiber reinforced composites. This can be applied to any type of uh, sort of any type of uh, application as well. But this was made uh, for uh, fiber reinforced composites in general. So intermediate and so first of all, you do have a selection of the components that you're going to use. And then you look at the technical feasibility, right? Do they mix well? Uh, what would be the young modulus? What would be the strength? What would be the durability? And those kind of technical questions that you ask for. Certain uh, ASTM tests has to be run and performed and certain certifications need, uh, are required. And after the technical feasibility, you look at commercial feasibility because let's face it, they can be pretty expensive. Glass is cheap, but carbon is expensive. Right? Is it worth it? Will it actually provide a benefit commercially? And then you sort of come to a point where the demonstrator components uh, step is wrong. In terms of the, when we look at the components, we do have intermediate and structures. And they do pass because uh, fiber reinforced composites provide or polymer composites provide yes to each step, right? And for instance, they do fa fail for controlled emission tank. 
because these are advanced materials, like advanced materials. Do you really need a control? Do you really need a such a strong material for your table, for instance? Do you need carbon fiber table? No, you don't need carbon fiber table. That is why it will fail because you can make perfectly acrylic table on the train. Again, window frames, aluminum window frames are perfect or PVC window frames are perfect. They do carry a lot of weight, no problem. Do you? So that, that would be the question that you ask yourself. If I'm making a carbon fiber composite, do I need carbon fiber tables? Do I need carbon fiber frames? Do I need carbon fiber door leaves? No, I don't need them, right? The deck comes to a selection point of view. Some fail technically, some fail commercially, or some fail at initial component selection because the fiber uh, polymer composite is not a suitable material at the beginning, right? From this point of view, uh, fiber reinforced polymers are mainly used in the main train body or intermediate and structures on the railways. Right, so that's, let's have a look at a couple of examples, right? So this is not exactly a rain fiber reinforced uh, composites or materials. So this fiber reinforced polymer, this is actually uh, metal uh, matrix composite. So we do have a metal, so it has an aluminum core, and that one is uh, also, and you do have laminate composites, which is a polymer, and then you bring them together in a sandwich panel. So you use the best of both materials, and you get a lightweight and strong material. Instead of fiber, we do have metal in here. And in fact, uh, Tilting Train Express, TTX Korea, uh, build a train using sandwich panels. And all that body was made by these sandwich panels. And what it did, it, uh, decrease the weight, if I'm not mistaken, around 15%. We are looking at uh, Siemens made an attempt in Netherlands. So the front ends are glass fiber reinforced composites and the foam core sandwich construction, they still has a sandwich construction in here. Roofs are rigid aluminum as it is. And uh, vehicle underframe and side walls uh, were aluminum bonded to composite elements like this, right? So you do still have, so they do have a combination in here, which uh, both have a glass fiber reinforced as well as metal polymer matrices. So it's a combination of materials. So it's, it's a good example of uh trying different materials at different parts uh right bogies are the second heavy structural component and they also bear the heaviest load okay so they are extremely important in a train and togo produced a carbon fiber reinforced polymer prototype for uh, rodal bogies. So they replaced the steel. Originally, they are made of steel. So they replaced the steel with this carbon fiber black composite that you see here. And the weight was reduced by 50%. And it still met the European standards for rail bogey construction and fire smoke toxicity values. 
So it's a prototype under development, uh, but that itself decreased uh, the converting from steel to carbon fiber decreased the weight by 50%. And also it's a beautiful use of uh, carbon fiber or fiber reinforced polymers in a part apart from the train body itself. So that's a technical part and an advanced composite has been used. China made an attempt. So they were like, okay, so we do have a lot of carbon fiber factories. So they actually do have carbon fiber factories. So they were like, we're gonna make the entire train out of carbon fiber. And they did it. And that's why it looks like like. Also, can it be other color? Yes, it can be other color, but people tend to leave it black, right? So it's it's easy to change the color. It's, it's not a big deal, right? What do we have here? We do have the whole vehicle body. We do have the bochi frame. We do have the cap, the equipment compartment. They were all made from carbon fiber reinforced polymers. And overall, they uh, achieved 13% weight decrease. And they guarantee, so this is quote by quote, their words, no failures such as fatigue and corrosion of trains during the 30 year service periods and reduce maintenance and thus reduce entire life cycle costs. So that's their guarantee. They give you the guarantee that you will not have any failure regarding to fatigue or corrosion. That's a big promise. But again, if you don't use metal, nothing will corrode. It's not, they're not actually, so this is a nice example of fiber reinforced polymer. So it, this one comes from Australia and it's a, it's a panel that's used on the track. And this particular place is, is the uh, maintenance sort of uh, facility for the train. So what it happens, train comes for the maintenance and they can easily replace these panels, right? And then they do the maintenance from the uh, beneath of the train. So it's beautiful. As I heard, they are also looking for to apply this to suburban train districts uh, because they absorb sound and uh, lower the noise. And also they are easy to maintain. They are easy to replace. If one is broken, it's easy to replace, no problem. They are not uh, extremely expensive because these are not carbon fibers. <clears throat> we do have also technical ceramics or they may call advanced ceramics as well. We do have sort of different uh, applications in different type of trains. In electrical trains, we are looking for, uh, we are looking to carbon brushes for motors, ceramic heat exchangers, ceramic discs or resistors. I think someone's mic is on. Someone's microphone is on. Please check if your mic is on. And you have diesel trains. And in those cases, we do use ceramics for bearings and walls. Also, we do have ceramic seals sensory components, custom drive components, or fuel injector plungers. I would like to focus on the electrical train parts because they are becoming more and more frequent and they are the feature of uh, railway industry to my point of view. We do have, yes, yeah, so we do have these ones in cars as well, right? So if you are driving a, a sports car, 
you get you end up getting a carbon ceramic brake or if you are driving a premium car it comes with it anyway uh, these are also used in high speed trains because traditional steel brakes or traditional alloy brakes they're not actually uh, good enough to stop the uh, high speed vehicle what is it? It, it? it actually is a composite of carbon fibers, silicon carbide, and metallic silicon. In terms of the fabrication, we do start with carbon fiber, right? So you fraction uh, that carbon fiber, you actually sort of put it into small pieces, and then you mix it with. Uh, you mix it with uh, a type of polymer and then you mold it to the shape that your brake is and then you start machining and pyrolysis. Pyrolysis where you burn out all the, uh, simply all the polymer and you carbonize everything, right? And then after you introduce uh, silicon into the environment at around uh, 1700 degrees, right? 1700 degrees Celsius in under argon, argon gas. And then you get anti oxygen treatments, and then you do right, uh, fine machining and you assemble it and give it. What is the benefit of it, right? So obviously it has a longer life. Carbon brakes, today their life cycle is obviously twice than steel brakes. It is cost effective because of the life cycle cost uh, ratio. And also you do not get, so there is a life cycle. Also, there is a, a possibility of breakage. The carbon uh, breaks are not easy to uh, fail. So that gives you an extra sort of saving. They are obviously high performance materials. Carbon breaks, they do have greater energy absorption capability than steel brakes. And also they are light in weight, significantly light, uh, lighter than the steel brakes itself. So in fact, if we sort of look at the steel brake that we have, and so that's a combination of different random all these minerals lurking around. They all have a purpose in here, by the way. They are mixed with iron. They all have a purpose, but then it's random, right? That's why the, they do the job, but they are not high performance. On the other hand, all these ordered sort of structure, that carbon strength of it, and all that infused in within each other, that gives you an extra level of bear loading or uh, strength that actually uh, absorbs the energy, right? So you still have carbon and silicon. So that's sort of like the silicon from the coming from the silicon siliconization process, right? <laughs> And we do have high uh, power ceramic resistors because especially in high speed trains, sometimes even you use, because first of all, you have, especially if you are in a high speed train, you really need to use carbon brakes, right? But again, even carbon brakes may not be enough sometimes to stop the kinetic energy and high speed. In this case, uh, ceramic resistors are 
also employed alongside the carbon ceramic plates. Slowing down is, is not easy and the mechanical effect of the brakes usually is not enough, especially in a high speed train. What these resistors do, they convert that high kinetic energy to the heat. And ceramics are really good heat conductors. So they conduct that heat immediately to elsewhere, right? and the heat is removed, kinetic energy is removed by heat itself. So it's a pretty nice process. And because they are dielectric in nature, they will not create any type of voltage spikes when all these um, encounter of materials happen, occur. So that's, that's a beautiful technology or beautiful idea behind uh, using the ceramic resistors to help the uh, brake system. Yes, so ceramics can also be used as heat exchangers because what we said, they are very good at transporting heat. So they, they do have high thermal conductivity. So that's sort of like the best property about them, if you ask me, right? Uh, hence, they provide eco-friendly water cooling. Why? Because the if you don't use ceramic, you will end up using oil. What will going to happen to oil, right? So you will, ceramics are more eco-friendly. Uh, combined to conventional methods. And obviously they have better efficiency in cooling. So that comes with um, another sort of advantage because if you efficiently remove the heat during the slowing down, then the overall um, damage or fatigue that is going to happen on the brakes will decrease drastically, right? So you will end up using brakes for a longer period of time. That is a very important advantage. Also, they are resistant to corrosion. They do not corrode. And they are good at electrical insulation. And overall, they come with a longer life and low, lower life cycle cost compared to conventional heat exchangers. So if anyone is sort of uh, interested in ceramics, I highly suggest to uh, look deep into other types of ceramic that can be used for heat exchangers in, in railway uh, braking system. Currently, aluminum nitride is used, but I believe we may find better examples than aluminum nitride. Right. Okay, thank you very much. So that was it for today. I did not want to uh, take a lot of your time. And thank you very much for your intention and attention. Right. Okay, uh, first of all, I would like to thank my manager for this very informative presentation. Uh, I think that it was very productive for all of us. Uh, so we hope to see you in our next STARS tutorial session. Have a nice day. Thank you, bye bye. You're welcome.